that on behalf of Church Action on Poverty Northeast, I'd like to issue a very warm welcome to you all to this celebration of Church Action on Poverty Sunday, which this year is being hosted by Sunderland Minster. As most of you will know, Church Action on Poverty is a national ecumenical organization committed to tackling poverty in the UK. It was started way back in the 1980s, and there has been an active group in the Northeast here since that time. In recent years, conscious of the major contribution of the churches to food bank provision, Church Action on Poverty has been asking us to look at the changes needed to make food banks unnecessary in our relatively affluent society. And this means working on changes to universal credit to make it a real safety net, establishing a living wage for all. And we'll be hearing from Sunderland about how they are leading the way on this in our region. It means addressing the unfair system. That means the poor pay more for food, fuel, finance, and yes, even funerals. And as we emerge from COVID, it means looking at how we can reset the debt, which has been accrued through circumstances that nobody could have foreseen and is really calling for the application of the principles of Jubilee. In all this, Church Action on Poverty listens to and takes its lead from the experts. That's the people who know what it's like to have to choose between eating and heating. To juggle two or three jobs as well as family just to survive. To feel not counted and not valued. And today we will be hearing contributions from those, some of those experts and we will be valuing them. As we awake to the changes that are needed to make our society work for all, Church Action on Poverty asks us to consider how our churches need to change so that they become places of welcome for all and places where all can flourish. Church Action on Poverty Sunday presents us with an opportunity to make this question a priority. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Stuart Bain. Um, I, I support the wonderful title of Provost of Lubminster. Um, in other times, we would have looked forward to welcoming you into our wonderful building. But I'm afraid this evening I wasn't going to sit in the cold and, and talk to you from there. So, uh, as ever, we're learning to do things from other places. So, welcome to our dining room. Um, the order of service you've seen on the screen, and I think it'll be fairly straightforward as we go through it. What you need to say or join in with will be in front of you. Um, if I could ask you, to, if you're not already muted, if you would mute, um, it is unmuted. just in case. Um, I don't know if someone, I'd say stay on mute if you could, because um, we all know during these Zoom sessions, um, occasionally things happen. People arrive, dogs arrive, doorbells go, and all this kind of thing. But when we, we will unmute at a particular point in the, in the piece, um, but that's later on. So, as I say, a, a very warm welcome um, from the Minster, not to the Minster. Um, Chris Housen, who will also be leading part of the worship, is part of the Minster team and university chaplain for Sunderland. So, of course, having done it this way, I'm sure that we are welcoming people from uh, from much further afield than we would have done if, as I say, we were we were hosting in church. So it's great to uh, to have you with us, even if it's always tricky to see everybody. Um, but you are there. I know you're there. Um, so that's wonderful. I'm going to pass over now. We're going to begin with um, some opening prayers. As, as we gather together, we pray. Come God, come walk with your people. For you alone are our strength and glory. We have put our trust in you. Come God, come walk behind us, beside us, before us, 
for you alone are our shelter and direction. And we have put our trust in you. Come God, come seek us and find us and put us right. For you alone are the light in our darkness. And we have put our trust in you. Come God, we know you are near. The sound of your footsteps sets us dancing. Help us to praise and worship you. Thank you very much for that opening prayer. Now, as we said, in terms of being part of Church Action and Poverty, what's vital uh, that the organisation does and that we do is listening to the voices of the people on the front line of poverty and those with direct experience of dealing with the impact impacts of that poverty. So we're delighted that um, Penny Walters, Callum Alley and Steph Benson have agreed to pre be pre-recorded uh, so we'll enjoy listening to their stories or, or hear their stories. Uh, between each story there'll be a short pause to reflect on the organisations that work with them and maybe our response to hearing that story. But uh, over to you Liam putting the stories on. Thank you. Program, which is part of Church Action on Poverty national campaign. We are classed as experts as by experience, which is a title I quite readily agree with, because that's what I am. I am an expert by experience. I have the lived experience of being in poverty, which is really, really hard. When you've gone from having everything that you want and having a comfortable life to then having nothing and not being able to make ends meet and living off absolutely fresh air. Having to put margarine in a dish of pasta to make one simple meal that is the only meal you're going to get that day. It's really, really hard. Some people don't realise that this is how people live. Even more so now, people have to scrimp and scrape just to get the basics through. It's part of this pandemic. It's also part of what the government have done. It's easy just to brush it under the carpet and think, doesn't concern us. But these could be your neighbours. These could be your friends. These are people that you wouldn't necessarily think are in poverty or in food poverty or are having to do without. These are people that you see every day, but you don't realise it. You don't ask the right questions. They are very proud people. We are all very yes. proud people. We need support. Oh, oh, this is... Right one of the reasons why okay, as a campaigner and an activist with food power and church action on poverty i readily share my story i am a proud person but i would like other people to hear what i have to say i don't mind admitting to say that i would readily have one meal a day and that would be it just because we didn't have enough but I'd like to share the fact that that's how we got by. This makes it even more powerful, the fact that that's how we lived. We have done campaigns in the House of Lords. We have done campaigns in America. We see how other people live. Hello, my name's Julie Mohammed, and I'm the Accommodations Team Leader for the Take Key Project. With us today, I've got Callum Alley, who would like to discuss how um, 
probably you affect me done when you was grown up. I'll hand you over. Well, as you explained, my name's Carla Valley. Um, I'm from South Shields, Cambria. Um, I was raised by my dad, who was a single dad, and a lot of the time we were forced through like the hard times and the hardships of like poverty. So, what would you say the impact poverty had on you growing up, Callum? Well, a lot of the time it was like my dad wasn't very well, as you know, and like basically, like it was like we had to knock on the doors, like of my dad's friends and stuff, so being like very young age and basically go between door to door, like asking for money or something like that, to so we could get like food, like gas, and that make up while I was going to scrape by. Um, and then that progressed into basically going to school with like, eventually it was like ripped clothing and stuff like that, like just absolutely covered in holes and stuff and like basically social services got, got involved. And that's when like I ended up basically getting a lot more like basically clothing handed to us from like donations from social services and like basically like Salvation Army and stuff like that and I was bully for that. Even though you were a child and you were innocent and you, know, yeah, much. you had no part in it. Okay, so what are your hopes after COVID? Well, first of all, I'm hoping to get back into work, basically progress forward basically have that form of income and be like be able to like carry on like as a working man and just be able to be proud of myself with that income and stuff you know what I mean um, I'm also hoping to be selling into my flat and um, basically hoping that's decorated hoping that I can basically just move on with it by what I need to do so and stuff like that and I'm also on planning on being more social and like getting back out there, mending them broken bridges, basically just communicating a lot more with people. Yeah. 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 Fabulous. So you, you've just trained recently for a job. Do you think that's mm. going to um, give you better hopes for when um, you're in the job market? Um, yeah, to be fair, it is because um, basically I've got my team leader certificates now and I've also got my whole business certificate. Excellent. So basically, that's going to basically just help us power forward and hopefully help us progress through the ranks a bit quicker. Okay, thank you, Callum. No problem. The importance of dignity is that it gives you back your self-worth. So often people in poverty don't have control over a lot of events around them. So I'm on sickness benefits and I get reassessed every two years. And I don't have control over whether I'm going to have enough money to live off for the next two years or not. And people might be in private rental housing and they don't have control over whether the landlord will come and make repairs for them or not or they're looking for work and they can't force an employer to offer them a job they might just be getting repeated rejections and a lot of these situations can be very demoralizing and they they can strip away your confidence in yourself and in in your ability to change your future because you quite often don't have a huge amount of ability to control your future. Whereas the Poverty Truth Commission, it, it brings you into a situation where you can make a change because you're talking to the people who have decision-making power and they're listening because they want to learn. And that gives you that, that power again that most people have over a substantial part of their life where you can make a difference in 
your own life but also in the lives of other people so you know you're making a difference in the world you're helping other people's lives to be better which everyone wants to do humans are social creatures we like to help one another out and part of poverty it's not just that you can't support yourself it's not being able to help other people either because you're so restricted in your own finances your own time your own resources and that in itself is a really horrible place to be in so to have to have people listen to you to take you seriously to implement your suggestions to actually want to give you some control and give you the decision making power that's a really it's a really wonderful experience remember the generosity of god and all that he has given and to think about how the way you live your life can either bring glory to God or dishonor to God and that actually part of how we worship God is how we live lives that display God's character to other people and part of God's character is a massive concern for people in poverty and for people who are victims of injustice and therefore one of the things that Christians are called to do to worship God and to serve him is to stand up for people in poverty, stand up against injustice and to work for change so that poverty can be eradicated. A huge uh, thank you to Penny and Callum and Steph and all those who were involved in filming that. I think now we may be over to uh, Jonathan, if I'm yeah. correct. That's right. Thanks, Chris. We're going to hear our short Bible reading three times. And the idea is this, that the first time gives us a chance to get our bearings, to think, um, oh, it's that one or Maybe you've not heard it before. So the, the question is, is that in the Bible? Goodness, I didn't realize that. The second time, there's a chance to just think for a moment what it might have sounded like to the people who first heard it when it was first written, first told. And the third time we come to the same short Bible reading, the idea is that we can ask ourselves what it's saying to us today. Um, so here we go. Um, the St. Mark Gospel in chapter 2 tells us that once when uh, the followers of John the Baptist and the Pharisees were keeping a fast, some people came and asked Jesus why his disciples were not fasting as well. And this reading is part of his answer to that question. And if Zoe has managed to get in through our technical difficulties at the beginning, Zoe, over to you to read. Thank you, Jonathan. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, otherwise the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old and the worse tear is made. No one and no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and so are the skins. But one puts new wine so here we hear Jesus using two images from the everyday experience of people in his society. New cloth has not yet shrunk and if you use it as a patch it's going to shrink when you wash it and it's going to make a bigger hole. Similarly if you've got old wine skins that have lost their stretch you don't put new wine in them or it might burst them as it ferments, then you've lost the skins and the wine. So maybe you can wonder at this moment how that sounded to the people who were the first to hear these words. And we're going to hear the reading again, this time from Saeed. If you're there, Saeed. I think. And if not, Chris is going to. I, I mean, you struggle yeah. to get in. So I'll. I'll yeah, read maybe. That for Saeed. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Yeah. 
No one sews a piece of unshrunk sh shrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. In a few minutes, we're going to have a chance to talk about what these words from Jesus might stimulate in our minds now. But first, let's hear two of our political representatives talking about some of the realities of today. Um, the second of the two is going to be the, um, the MP for South Shields, Emma Lewell Buck, interviewed by Joe Benham Brown. But before Emma, we're going to hear from Councillor Graham Miller, who's leader of Sunderland City Council, um, and Graham Miller's being interviewed by Val Barron. So as a member of the Time and Weir Citizens Living Wage Action Team, we're really excited that Sunderland has become our first local authority in the North East to accredit as a living wage employer. So I just wanted to ask you, why is accreditation so important to you as a leader of the council? Personally, as a, a socialist, as a democratic socialist that believes that society needs to ensure that everybody gets what they require to have a, a fair and healthy life. The first step as a local authority was to try and move the real living wage from the council, because the council has been a real living wage employer since 2014, and our staff benefit from that principle of a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, move that into our supply chain so that our contractors coming forward must also give a real living wage or we will not contract with them. Now, I think in the 21st century, it's absolutely vital that we are trying to minimise the number of people in Sunderland who are living uh, with the fear of a low wage, insecure job economy. People doing multiple jobs because they're not getting paid enough. I remember my dad worked 38 hours a week. You know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a high paid uh, employee. He was a blue collar worker, but he was a skilled worker. And that was his wage and he brought it home and it paid for everything. You know, there was never a huge amount of money in the family, but him working full time paid for everything. Now, as a society, we currently don't have that. The real living wage is the start of us moving to try and get back to that situation where people are getting paid enough to live on from their job and do not have the mental health issues allied to those, those concerns. So I was delighted that we got that through Sunderland as the council first. The unions were very, very pleased with us and rightly so. And now what we've got to try and do is move that message into the other local authorities in the area who haven't done it because the financial pressures. My view on, on financial pressures is there are items in life that are morally necessary and moving everybody within Sunderland onto a real living wage is a moral requirement as far as I'm concerned and as long as I'm leader. Uh, the Labour group who uh, uh, elected me as leader are strongly of the same view and we will continue to push to spread the real living wage across the North East. It is very important for people. Thank you. And my final question, what message would you give other employers, whether from the public, private or third sector, about the importance of accrediting? I genuinely believe, and we see it as the local authority, that when you accredit to being a real living wage employer, whilst there is an increased wage element to your costs, there's no, no getting away from it, it clearly means that. What you get from that, however, and the evidence is there and has been there from de for decades, is a more motivated, more reliable uh, workforce. People know that you're paying them a fair wage. 
and they stay with you. The churn in your, your staff levels drops, sickness drops. People are more committed to the business because the business is committing to them by paying them a real wage. And I genuinely uh, would ask employers to consider the benefits of having a loyal, happy workforce with a restricted turnover in key members of staff because you've taken the decision to pay them slightly more, which means, and this is tongue in cheek, that as the, the owner of the business or the, the chief exec of the business, you, you only have to buy yourself a Porsche every other year rather than every year. Uh, surely you don't need that many new cars and investing in your staff is the best investment any employer can make. And I learned that in business over 20 years, working with a large American company who absolutely put their staff first, which was why they made such an awful lot of money because the staff worked hard to pay them back. So as a member, So I suppose I'm quite keen to see um, this March will be the first time ever that the government's results over food insecurity measurement will be out. Mm -hmm. And that's come off the back of a private member's bill that I introduced to Parliament. Prior to that, hunger and food insecurity wasn't measured in the UK. We we're one of the few Western countries that didn't do that. So I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that. But more importantly, once we've got those results, we can then look you know it takes the political football out of you know is poverty happening or not yeah. because often in the chamber and the house of commons there's arguments back and forwards you know or oh, there's not that many people poor there's not that many people going hungry well these figures and these stats from the implementation of my bill will show exactly where the hot spots are and it will prove that there are people going without that we already know of but there'll be pockets of people that we don't know of either and it'll be a way of drilling down and getting into those communities and finding out what's going on and trying to help out. There's also, um, I'm currently trying to push through my school breakfast bill because there's, um, there's about 2 million kids turn up to school every day, still hungry. Mm -hmm. um, the school breakfast provision that the government have put in expires this year. There's no funding in place for it to continue. However, there is money in the soft drinks industrial levy that could make it continue and it could hit every single school where they are disadvantaged children because at the minute I think it only hits under 10% of the schools that it should. Mm -hmm. So I've got a meeting with the minister soon, I'm gathering lots of support for that and I'm hoping that that bill will be implemented so that no child turns up too hungry at the school to learn. Yeah. And there's also, you know, we're coming up to the summer again where there's holiday activity and food um, groups happening right across the country. That came off the back of another bill that I helped sponsor, which ensured that the government gave money. But again, you know, none of this, none of this is tackling the root causes of poverty, or the root causes of hunger. It's all stick and plaster stuff. And really, until the government start implementing policies and making sure people have enough to live on, then we're always going to be just putting a stick and plaster over a problem that's going to get worse and worse, especially in the middle of the pandemic. I wonder though, do you feel, as an active Christian, do you feel that your personal beliefs influence your politics at all? I mean, this is always a tricky one. And, and for me, you know, um, I'm, I'm a Catholic and Catholicism has its roots in social justice. It always has. Um, and, you know, I was a Catholic long before I was a Labour Party member. So obviously there's going to be some, some links there and I am going to approach my work as an MP with those, those teachings and that ethos behind us. It's something that's never going to leave us. But I always make sure that, you know, as, a, as an MP and as a politician, you've got to not push your faith down people's throats so to speak because some people don't like that so but it is it's it's a core it's who it's who I am um I grew up with those teachings I grew up with those values of you know if there's someone in need do everything you can to help them even if you haven't got much yourself you know I grew up in a community where everyone helped each other out and you know I'd go to church every Sunday with and it was a place where people come together and, and helped each other. And, and that kind of thing is just, it's rooted through my DNA. It's who I am and it will never leave us. And I think it does transfer into my work in Parliament as well, because the one thing that I've pushed for in the seven years I've been there 
is action on poverty and that definitely comes from my faith and from my early experiences in the church. What do you think will be key in the next year to address the needs of those that are unfortunately likely to find themselves in poverty? I mean, I think, you know, I've always been really clear that poverty isn't inevitable and it is a direct result of policies from central government. We're in the middle of a pandemic. This isn't going to go away, this pandemic, anytime soon, despite what we keep hearing. And more and more people are going to be slipping into poverty through no fault of their own. So we need to have a situation where the state gives everybody enough to live on where people have enough money to survive so that they're not having to rely on charity, they're not having to rely on faith groups, and they're not having to rely on their neighbours, because that is never a substitute for proper state support. Mm -hmm. And eventually that will run out. We've seen it ourselves in, in our local food banks, you know, shelves have been bare from time to time. So there needs to be a situation where literally, you know, we are still a rich country, despite everything that's happening, despite our economy tanking at the minute, we are still one of the wealthiest countries in the world. There is enough there. It's about having the political will to make sure that those who are going without don't go without. So we've heard those powerful individual stories and we've heard commentary in a sense on situations that we face in the nation from local Northeastern political um, leaders. Now we remind ourselves in this Teze song, this Teze chant, what's at the very heart of the kingdom of God and that it is justice and peace so that's so I'd invite you to join with us in the chant, but it would help if you mute. Do sing, but uh, keep the mute button on. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and open in us the gate. and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come Lord and open in us the gates of your kingdom. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and open in us the gates of your kingdom. There's going to be a chance in a moment to go into small groups to discuss a couple of questions. But first, I'm going to read again our short Bible reading. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. I think the, uh, the Zoom system is going to put you into a small group with other people. Um, we don't need you at the end of this time of sharing your ideas 
we don't need you to report back afterwards. These are for you to carry away the ideas that you have. Um, I'm not quite sure how we're handling the timing because we started a bit late, but you're going to have 15 minutes or more in the group. So what I suggest is that you introduce yourself. Um, and over the last year, under the restrictions and the, the implications of COVID-19, you will have seen cracks in our society that we haven't really taken notice of before. So the two questions are, what have the last few months brought to our attention that previously we hadn't noticed? And then a question about new wine and new wineskins. We may have new ideas, but what are the structures we're going to put them into? How will we do things differently in the future? So what have you noticed over the last year that you hadn't noticed before about our society? And how are we going to do things differently in the future? Right. Sorry, Liam, I, I, I accidentally left. Sorry, Liam, <laughs> I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> I'll see if I can get you into a room just one moment don't worry I can come back otherwise sorry about that stupid uh, okay yeah, I can see I'm going to assign you to a room uh, there you go does that that seems should work
I have to leave the meeting because I've got another one at seven o'clock. I'm so sorry. Okay, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, it's wonderful. Well. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm glad you found it useful. Have a good evening. Thank you. May I just, I too have to go. Okay. Um, it's been a great experience. Um, okay. And it's the teachers and the parents and the children that um, trying to juggle all these different demands that most I've learned the most about in these months. Thank That's you. Interesting. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry about the bumpy start. Thank you. <laughs> Bye now. Thanks. Bye.
Well, thank you all very much. And I'm sure that a lot of those discussions that you've been having are going to live on uh, in the prayers that we're about to, to share. Um, just before we have those prayers, I'm just going to invite you um, just to have a, a moment's pause. Uh, I'm just a, few, a little bit of silence to just lift some of the stuff, those discussions before God. And also perhaps just to remember Penny and Callum and Steph who we heard from earlier in your prayers. Just a few moments of, of stillness. And I'm just going to invite the person who's going to be your all, um, who's going to respond uh, in the bold bits uh, to be the only other person that is um, unmuted. And then um, if everyone else mutes, that will help. But please say the words in bold if you're muted back in the comfort of your home. Heavenly Creator, we look back on the last year with horror and with wonder. We are horrified at the loss of life in our nation and throughout the world, but in awe that you have been ever present in the pandemic, bringing hope and healing through the people of God. You have brought kindness into chaos. We thank you for signs of hope and healing. God, we are sorry for the times when we have been slow to respond to the needs of our neighbours, especially to those who have been more vulnerable. We pledge ourselves to the service of those who have been hit hardest by the pandemic, poorer communities, the black community, those in the front line of dealing with the public, those who have lost their livelihoods. God, help us to rebuild our communities with fairness and justice. And we give thanks, God, for organisations, neighbours, relatives, churches, charities, have gone the extra mile to look out for those who have been hurting. We give thanks for the NHS and care workers who have nursed hundreds of thousands back to life, to health. We thank the shop workers, the taxi drivers, the cleaners, all who have kept our nation together through this time. We give thanks to all who have helped us through this pandemic. Lord, help the churches to respond with a new determination to be alongside the weak and vulnerable and to listen to the words of those in our midst who need to have their voices heard. Help us to find new ways to serve our communities, to be new wineskins for the new wine that is pouring throughout our land. Help us to renew and refresh our commitment to serve and to challenge. So please join in with these words at home, though keep on mute. Lord, for all that we need to do. Let Jesus, Jesus guide, us. guide us. For all that we need to challenge. Let Jesus give us courage. For all the work to rebuild our nation. Let the Holy Spirit give us the tools of change. For new hope, new wine. Let the Holy Spirit shape us into new wineskins. For good news to the poor. Let God shape us and embolden us. For creating the reign of God's justice and mercy. Let God renew our hearts and minds. Amen. Amen.
I think it's over to Neil now, if I'm correct. Thank you, Chris. Might be wrong. Uh, it's so nice to be with everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm Neil Cooper. I'm Director of Church Action on Poverty. Uh, and it's so nice to be welcomed to Sunderland Minster. Um, just a shame we're not there in person. Um, but it's lovely to, uh, to be with you, to be with everybody, and to be inspired by the words we've heard. Um, what we know and what we knew before, but what we've certainly known through the past year, um, is that we're not all in the same boat. Uh, that the pandemic has thrown up uh, or cast a light on the inequalities in society and exacerbated them in so many ways um, that we can't even start to talk about tonight. But hopefully you've been inspired by some of what you've heard too. Uh, we've been working with Emma Lul Buck now for many years, um, fighting to end hunger in the UK, working with her on the, the bills that she mentioned uh, to ensure that we do measure household food insecurity, to know how many people are going hungry and to ensure that people do, children do get fed during school holidays, which has been such an issue over the past year. Um, our vision at Church Action on Poverty is that uh, everybody should be able to have access to good food, to dignity, to hope, and to be able to speak truth to power. And we've heard particularly from Penny and Callum and Steph, the power that they have speaking their own truth from their own experience. Uh, we need, as we come out of the pandemic, to create more space to hear those on the margins, their truth, their wisdom, and for them to be in spaces where they can influence and shape how we move forward as communities and as a country. Uh, next month, we're launching a new programme, Speaking Truth to Power. It's been a theme of ours, but next month we're starting to support 24 people like Steph and Callum and Penny, who have stories to share, to give them the skills and tools and support to share their stories, but to speak truth to power, to whoever it is that they want to influence and whatever truth they want to speak. So I'm going to invite you to support that work, to support people like Callum and Penny and Steph and many others to be able to speak their truth. Uh, for us, that's absolutely central, not just to our work, but to how we're going to move forward as a society. So the more that we're able to fund that work to support people to speak truth, uh, the better. We know for some people, the pandemic has meant that there is little money. So if you're in that situation, please don't feel that we're asking you to give what you don't have. But we also know uh, for many people, actually, the, the weirdness of the pandemic is it means we've actually got spare money because we've not been able to spend it. We've not been on holiday. Uh, we've not been going out to the theatre or the cinema or uh, whatever else we might be doing with our money. And if you're in that situation, then maybe you're able to actually make a donation one-off donation or regular giving because the regular giving monthly giving five ten pounds a month even two pounds a month can make a huge difference to the amount of support we can give to enable to speak truth to power um, i'm so passionate about the difference we can make and so excited about the possibilities even in these difficult times of creating a community where people as staff said can live lives with dignity with agency and power. Um, I'd love you to join us in that task. And so if you can donate, or if you can pray, or if you can act in other ways as part of the growing movement uh, to bring dignity, agency and power to people on the margins of society, please do. Thank you. Now, I wonder, Liam, if you could take the screen share off just so that we could have gallery view or is that, that's good. See lots of people I've not seen before. Um, we've got five screens, believe it or not. So uh, that's fantastic. Um, we're gathered here 
in a sense, around a common purpose. And we're gathered here um, in the peace of Christ. For Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name. So let's share his peace on Zoom, however you want to do it. Give a wave, an offer of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And also with you. <laughs> also with peace. You. <laughs> also with peace. You. Peace, peace, peace be with you. Peace, peace be with you. Peace, 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 be, with you. peace, peace, peace be with you. 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 Thank you. Peace be with everyone. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> peace be with you. I'm going to invite um, Bernadette to join with me in a prayer of a blessing. God bless our place with silence, solitude and space that we may pray god bless the night and calm the people's fright that we may love god bless our cities and move our hearts with pity lest we grow hard god bless these days of rough and narrow ways, lest we despair. God bless this land and guide us with your hand, lest we be unjust. God bless this earth through the pangs of death and birth and make us whole. Amen. 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 Well, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Thank you for joining us, uh, wherever you joined us from. Uh, um, and it's to host you from, um, from the Minster, or at least from the Minster dining room uh, mm -hmm. that is ours. So, I pray that you may have um, a good evening, what's left of it. Go well, stay safe. And as we come through this, let's work to build our nation into that just place that God seeks it to be. So bless you all. I'm going to hand over to Chris Housen. Um, there will be an opportunity just for a little bit of chat, but I'll pass across to Chris now. So thank you and bless you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Neil. All those in headquarters who've worked hard. Thank you to Bernadette and that great team who I know have done so much. Thank you to our readers and our participants. So thank you all very much. What we said at the end is that we'd, we'd have a little bit of chaos and that you know, there, there might be some people you haven't seen for a while. And we don't mind if you uh, send them messages or... Oh, oh yeah but um but, um, but you're, you're free to go now though if you want to go <laughs> but do come to Sunderland when it's when you're safe to come to Sunderland we'd love to have you up here behind is the Victor Hara Liberation Theology Library we love students of the Liberation Theology coming and spending time with us it's a great city to look at those uh, issues um but yeah but message each other we won't close it down and uh, if you want to say hello to someone you haven't seen, I saw Mary Horan over here. She's so lovely. I haven't seen her since Bradford days. So very good. And Peter, who, who's in Liverpool, bless you. Come back to Sunderland anytime you want. You're very welcome. And right, thanks let's see to, what happens with the chaos, Stuart. Uh, thanks to um, the at home, It's good to see you from Jim and Jill. Thank you.
So we lost you, Liam. Go and say it again. What Thank was you that? to the Minster yeah. in Sunderland and thanks to Church Action on Poverty North East for arranging this and letting us uh, piggyback onto it as the national movement um, once we realised that people weren't going to meet in their churches. So it's been really good to be part of this with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Big thanks to you, Liam, for managing all the technology. and uh... Just about. <laughs> 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 All the videos and the yeah, 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 we're yeah, we're so pleased you were able to do it. Having to find a bigger room. Uh, yeah, well done for that. Well done, Pat Devlin. There, she's been working really hard at this in the background. And and um, just to say, the resources that Church Action Poverty are coming out with at the moment are spot on. Fantastic prayers from fantastic sermons. Do check out their website for all those resources. And uh, yeah, have we got any more resources coming up, um, Liam? <laughs> You're muted, Liam. We'll be publishing a new anthology next year to mark our 40th anniversary, and we've got more Bible studies. We've just published a set of Bible studies on the Acts of the Apostles that you can download now, and there'll be a new set later in the year on the Gospel of Luke. I think it's the Gospel of Luke. We're working on those now. So, yeah, keep looking for them. That's great. And we've got some brilliant... People haven't, yet, um, people haven't yet uh, seen a copy. We've got an anthology of poetry... Yeah. That came out last autumn, same boat. Lots of people experiencing different aspects of poverty through the pandemic. A lot so a lot of the poetry is from people who are, are experts by experience. Great and stuff. you got some people reciting some of that poetry, I think, on your on your on your on your website. Is that right? I heard some brilliant recitations of that. I've just posted the link in the uh, chat if anyone's interested in that. Brilliant. I can and we're definitely serving tea and recommend coffee. Bible studies because I think that they're really, really interesting. They get such a different perspective on some of those Bible stories. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. I guess you, well, anyone's welcome to write. There's, we've got something called the Church Action on Poverty uh, Worship Collective, which I'm really glad to be part of. And we're always looking for people who want to write new prayers and new reflections on Bible stories. And, and just to reiterate, teas and coffees are available downstairs in my kitchen and <laughs> Stuart's kitchen. <laughs> next year, next year. Next year. <laughs> You've got to like dogs because they've just gone out. <laughs> they were very well behaved through the worship. Better than Val Baron's cat. <laughs> oh. I'll be around shortly then chris <laughs> who who's who zoomed in from the furthest have we got anyone from uh anyone outside of england anyone from scotland oh, yeah. ireland there was Wales? there was um um pam from mull was in my small group i don't oh. know whether she's still with us pam are you there i had a group with pam from mull and judith from cornwall oh my um, word and barry from Hud <laughs> field so uh, <laughs> we were spread wide well oh, i never yes. asked where ours was from <laughs> well i'm from oxfordshire hey that's good and my, we had a sorry we had a stranger from london in our group uh, <laughs> and we've got my, my, my youngest daughter used to work for church action on poverty um uh, in manchester a few years ago she was a fundraiser for a year or so oh. Excellent. We've we've got Cardiff and Edinburgh in the in the chat. So brilliant. We had Cassius uh, from uh, Birmingham. He was fantastic. So yeah, and padding and Paddington. Yeah. And Paddington. Yeah, sorry, Paddington. Paddington. Lovely. But I'm cooking my supper, so I'm actually going to disappear in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we've allowed people to catch up. Um, so you're all free to go home. I know you're all waiting to do uh, to write that book that you've been meaning to write and or maybe do those dance classic classes. I've taught myself ballet uh, during the lockdown. It's amazing to watch. <laughs> Come on, Chris. We've got to see that now. I've done a bit of ballet myself. <laughs> Not in lockdown, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Good night, bye everyone. Bye. Thank, bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Good night.